This is Chapter 7, Part 2. I went into the clump of trees, remembering mentally that over there was where I had seen a clearing. I reached it at about 20.10, 10 minutes after 8 p.m. I was 10 minutes late and worried about this. I still had the sphere in my hands, and I looked around me, but didn't see anything unusual. I looked up and saw only branches and leaves. Then I heard something like a distant boat motor, which was lost in the distance. I waited in the woods as the minutes passed, terribly slowly. I looked at my watch, and it was now 2015. I thought, dear God, what is going to happen? Protect me in any case. <laughs> I began to feel fear. It gave me a sincere fright. There I was, representing all the people who were praying for me and thinking of backing out. I decided I would not give up. At 2025, I began to hear a tremendous noise. I was in the woods and could not tell where it was coming from. Suddenly, the whole area was illuminated brilliantly. Two huge craft approached and passed directly over me. They came streaming water as if they had come from the bottom of the lake. Water cascaded from the sides like from a submarine when it surfaces. I waited breathless as I watched. They flew over me and the whole area warmed up from the heat. They must have put out a tremendous amount of energy. These craft were flattened disc forms and underneath I could see something that rotated and below that I saw three large white round parts that turned slowly and a colored light came out. These giant objects, such tremendous spectacle, gave me new cause for alarm. And then it fell silent. I could only hear a very low sound dying down. They hung there in the sky, about a hundred meters between the two, as best I could calculate. These objects were shaped like huge soup plates joined at the rims. They were about 45 meters in diameter and about 12 meters from top to bottom. I could see the cupola on top very clearly. The light slowly dimmed down, leaving only a small bright light source illuminated. It lighted only the area directly under the craft. Then one of the ships began to approach. The other remained quietly in place. It gave me a new fright to see this tremendous monster so close. And then it stopped, suspended above the small stream there, and two lateral beams of light came on. These new beams shined down, and I saw two beings descending in them as in an elevator. <laughs> wow, a beam of light elevator. In their descent, they disappeared behind the trees from my position, and I couldn't see them land. Then I heard their steps as they approached. <laughs> At this moment, all of the lights on the spacecraft went out, and they remained completely silent. After seeing the tremendous luminosity bright as day, I couldn't see anything when the light went out. And then I heard the steps of the beings, and then I saw them at 10 meters away. They approached, separated, one from the other. They wore helmets and suits that seemed very fitted, and I could see them clearly as they neared me. Then I heard the first telepathic communication. Brother, we are here. Do not fear. Ooh. <laughs> we are your friends. They tried to coordinate my ideas and thought. Yes, why not? I am not afraid. He peed his pants, that's all. Then I heard the voice say, I am your friend, Enrique. Do not be afraid. I shook my head. <laughs> I'm n -n 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 not afraid. <laughs> I could see that they were tall, more than a meter seventy in stature. That's not very tall. <laughs> when they came up to within two meters of me, he said, I am your friend, do not be afraid. I said, yes. And the other said, if you are not ready, we can suspend this until another day. If you are not afraid, we can continue this contact and we may ascend aboard. Oh boy. I said I was ready and I t -t 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 took a step forward <laughs> so that they could see that I had lost my f f f f fear. They noticed that I was a little wary, and one of them took me by the hand and the other by my shoulder and said, Walk with us up to the light. We went a few meters forward, and one of them said, Straight ahead, 
You feel a little worry in your head and in your body, but nothing is going to happen to you. The other said, Brother Enrique, we guarantee it. We do not want to cause you any harm. And then they ate him. <laughs> Moreover, if you are still afraid, you may return, and we will prepare this for another day. I could not see their faces for the helmets. I asked if the helmets had visors, and a form of visor raised a little in front of one, showing the nose and mouth, but partly covering the mouth, which had a rectangular shape. I could not see the Mameluco spacesuit well because of the dark, and I could not see up to now exactly what color they were. Then they stopped me and said they could sense a little worry. He was terrified. <laughs> At that moment, the spacecraft came forward and flashed a ray of light. I felt tremendous thrills and some twitching in all the skin of my head, like needles pricking me. I stood erect and began to ascend. When I saw that I was leaving the trees below, I thought, what if I should fall? I continued to ascend like in an elevator. I was surrounded by a yellowish light. It gave me the impression of being solid. I tried to touch it with my hands, and it felt solid like crystal. It must have been only energy because I did not see crystal. I didn't see anything. But when I touched the light, it felt solid. I felt a thump and then a port began to open and there it was fully open and I was inside and it closed. A moment later the other two entered, removed their helmet and smiled. They had taken their helmets off so I could see their faces. They asked me for the sphere which I gave them and then they said wait here take off your clothes and I took everything off. They opened an automatic port and we entered then they opened a side port like a window and looked at me smiling. I don't like to get naked in front of aliens. I heard a voice say, don't be afraid, we're going to enter a little smoke, but this is necessary. Do not be afraid. In spite of their assurances, I associated this immediately with the Nazis gassing the Jews. Wow. <laughs> I did not see where the smoke came from, but it came in and it smelled like lemon. It only lasted a minute and was then drawn out through some rectangular openings in the wall and disappeared. Then I noticed that there was no shadow from my body anywhere and I thought, where's the light coming from? I could not see any lamps. Then they gave me my clothes which I put on, leaving the ruana and sombrero aside. They opened a door and said, now you may proceed. They explained that the process was simply to disinfect everything from whatever microbes we may have brought from the Earth's surface. I went into the first compartment that they opened, and there were four persons seated there waiting for me. I came to the first one, and he said, Enrique, how are you? And gave me his hand. He gave me his hand like we shake hands and said, How are you, brother? I am going to shake your hand, said another. This, indicating the first, is the commander. He said his name was what sounded like Cramish. I gave him my hand, and he gave me some thumps on it. The rest greeted me this way also. The only one who did not give me his hand was the first who had said, Brother Enrique. He now turned to me and said, I am Cyril. I said, How are you, Cyril? And he said, Cyril, Cyril Weiss. Remember in 1969 in Caracas, Venezuela, at the entrance to the theater, when we met? And I said, Cyril Weiss. Oh, Cyril Weiss, but you are a little changed. And what are you doing here? And he said, I am one of the crew of this ship. I was terribly surprised. He said, we have been in contact with you for eight years. I understood now why they had given me their hands like Terrans. Then he presented me to the others. There was one by the name of Kremakan, and another named Krulula and Krenza. And then he told me that his name was not Cyril, but Krishnamark. The name sounded Hindu. They all spoke telepathically except the one who spoke first, who articulated words to me in perfect Spanish. They seated me there at a table as of crystal, with seats of material like plastic, with a leather-like finish. The beings were all dressed alike, 
except they had two types of suits. Some wore a silver colored outfit and the others had suits of a Coca-Cola color. There were others who had similar suits in a dark gray color with orange gauntlets and orange boots. Flashy dressers. <laughs> One of them took off his gauntlets so I could see his hands, which were perfectly formed. Their faces were beautiful and without blemishes and imperfections, but clean like a child. Their hair was long, coming almost to their shoulders. Kramakan told me that he is the commander of that ship and that there are 12 crew members. They are making contacts in order to divulge to them clearly what is going to happen on this earth. I asked him what kind of contacts and he said, men like you. He didn't say more on this and I did not pursue the subject further. I then asked him if they had women aboard and he said, yes, we have women with us, but at the moment we will not see them. Then I remembered that he could read my thoughts before I asked the question and knew I was going to ask it before I even formed the words. We began with the first questions. I had brought many questions given to me by the study group. Almost all of them were of a religious nature. I did not want to ask those at this time. I began by asking them where they were going to get their contacts and why they had chosen me. They told me that my name was not really Enrique. Ooh. <laughs> they told me another name, which I still have revealed to nobody. Heathcliff, maybe? I am waiting to see what develops in all of this first. I got the impression that they knew something about previous incarnations of mine for some reason. I asked them where they came from, and they replied, the Pleiades. I asked them, where are the Pleiades? And they said, It is what you call the Seven Sisters. And then I remembered that it is a small constellation having seven bright stars. I asked them how far it was from here. And they said, You say that it is more than 328 light years from here, which is not true. It's much farther. <laughs> so I asked them, How did you make the trip? Perhaps I was asking them infantile questions. But for me, they were important. How did you make such a long trip? They answered, Do you know anything about relativity? They told me that Albert Einstein's theory was not complete. That we are going to have to make three corrections. That the velocity of light is not, in fact, 300,000 kilometers per second, as we believe, but much more. And they went on to explain details that I could not follow. Well, is it written down anywhere? I'd like to read it. Maybe I can follow it. Then they told me there is another measure of time, unknown to us, in which we cannot remain long in physical bodies. I did not pursue this further after that. They took me to visit various rooms. I saw a room for meditation. They said it was where they rest and meditate. It was beautifully appointed with tremendously exquisite brocades. Another room was a laboratory where there were flasks of a green substance. I asked about this and they said it was chlorophyll, which they had extracted from our trees, a substance vital to their own alimentary system. So they digest food with chlorophyll. They use it in preparing various food items. They had fruits also. They told me they ate much fruit from South America. They particularly liked the Duraznos peaches and the melocotones apricots, and they carried much fruit, corn, wheat, rice, and other vegetable substances. To compensate for what they had taken, they used an ionizing radiant beam that accelerated the life process of the plants and caused them to replace their fruit in a few hours. Wow. <laughs> we got to get one of those. I wonder if the cattle mutilators were as considerate. I didn't quite understand this, that they could project a radiation that could accelerate the growth and maturity of the plants from which they had taken produce and cause it to be replaced in hours. This was incredible. Tell me about it. <laughs> I began to understand another thing. They knew about biological engineering and could control the genetic codes by means of a process which they called consubstantian. 
By this process, they could continue the life forces of a cell forever. Now, we have to get one of those. They tell me they were there on a mission. They belonged to a brotherhood of civilizations with others from which they had received specific orders from our world. They pointed out that we have always been guided indirectly by certain great personalities who have passed through our civilizations throughout history. Those so-called masters, some approaching divinity, have always had contact with extraterrestrials. I had a feeling that these beings had been sent on a mission pertaining to the evolution of our planet. Then Kremakan, the commander, permitted me to visit the control room where I saw great electronic maps on the wall. I saw the great panorama around us through the green glass cupola. There were three men seated, and as we entered, they came over and greeted me and then returned to the control panels of the craft. The control room was the third level under the dome on top of this craft. When I saw the maps, he took me to them and explained that they were cosmic maps. I could not understand them. I saw small lights. They moved a control and I saw small lights like neon in various colors beginning to take form on the map panel. There were points of light and lines of light and some of the lines were indefinite. Some of the greater points of light represented galaxies and nebulosities. They said that many thousands of inhabited planets are in contact with each other and exchange cultural, technological, and scientific information. We have to get in on that. Some are tremendously advanced in spiritual and scientific evolution. I asked which planets and he said it would be needless to tell me as the names would mean nothing to me anyway. He told me that where the lines between the lights were brighter, there was regular commerce. These dimmer ones were under exploration. The indefinite ones were lesser developed. They were on the map, but they lacked thousands of years of development before they were ready for contact. Now I'm curious, where do we fit in? When are we going to join in the fun? They do have a sense of time because they talked of millions of years, but I had difficulty coordinating this with their discussion of laws of relativity where time changes. Also, they seem to be aware of the future time because they told me we are going to experience a third world war and that they know exactly when it will start. I wish we could avert that, but we have crazy leaders. They desire that all men unite in one thought to seek real peace for the whole planet without distinction of race, creed, or color, that in the next few years we are going to make the greatest discovery in the history of the planet, the discovery of God, the final truth. But how is this possible, I said, if we already believe in God? Their answer was, you have never believed in God in a normal form. And I think I know what they meant. They called it a great unknowable, preferring to give the force no name. They told me that we have to distinguish between the inner and the outer forces. And I began to understand that we have searched for God outside when in reality it is within and that the kingdom of God is in every one of us. We must understand this first before we will live in peace and understanding with all men. They told me that they were in a way emissaries of beings superior to them and that they had been the destroyers of Sodom and Gomorrah. This gave me a great sensation. I said, how can you be judges? How can you destroy a nation with thousands of people, including many innocents? They said, you cannot comprehend this now. We will try to explain. We were emissaries of forces superior to us that govern the cosmos. And when they give us an order, we carry it out. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, it was exactly that. They sent emissaries, they warned the people, and they refused to understand and would not believe that which was happening over their heads. The hour arrived and it had to be destroyed. I thought, how could they be the judges? And I said that I could not understand, that I would not go into detail, but that I also could not understand. For me, it was not important to know at that time because there were other things. They told me the time of the beginning of the Third World War 
and told me that they had been the inspirers and the consultants on the building of the Great Pyramids, where they have placed many years of the Earth's history. In the future, we are going to discover two cities in South America where there are the records of the origin of the Earth's races and how they came here, how the history was written, and why it was done. Would that be Brazil? They told me the time of the beginning of World War III and said that we could delay that time three or four years and its intensity by a condition of heart, that mankind alone could do this because they are not permitted to interfere with nor restrict the freedom of action of a civilization such as is developing here. I understood what they meant quite clearly and didn't have to ask twice. They answered all my questions rapidly. Well, I don't think that's fair that a very small number of people get control of an entire civilization and force innocent people to die in wars. We need to rise up against these people and spreading the truth is the way to bring this to a head and stop this madness. World War III. It's got to be nuclear. It's going to destroy the planet, cause irreparable damage that will last for centuries, if not millennium. Now it seems he lost his fear. When I asked them if we could go someplace, they said, we're already traveling. From the moment you entered the craft, we have been traveling. They took me to a special panel there, like a great telescope, which I was allowed to look through. And it gave me the strange impression that I had gone out there into space, which was very still. There was no feeling of acceleration. It felt like the aircraft was standing still and not moving at all. I didn't hear any sound, and I couldn't detect the least movement. They seated me in front of a panel, which they opened and said, Here is your house. We seemed stationary, some five to 10,000 meters above it, and they focused it into the telescope device. They said it was an electronic device, but it had to be very advanced over any electronic telescope of ours because it could penetrate walls and metals, and I could see my family sleeping. I asked them if we could look at something else, and the craft, which had been hovering over my house, now began to move about, and I looked at the two great avenues in the city, and I saw the autos and the people in the streets. Time passed and we talked much. I looked at my watch and had to look again. It read 2025, almost 8.30 p.m. Krishnamurk said, Your watch is not going to function until you leave this craft. And he laughed. I asked him what caused this and he said, Precisely when you came within the field of this craft and energy force, it stopped. It may not work again. They must have a different notion of time from ours because I did not see clocks of any kind aboard. He just smiled and dropped the subject. I did not want to bother him about how long I had been aboard, as it did not matter anyway. He told me things about all our religions, which at this time I do not want to divulge. He told me something about the Fatima letter, which they seemed to know all about. At that time I understood, though, and I understood it also something that I had learned in a Mormon church, that hidden in the heart of all men are the great truths of all time, waiting to be awakened, and that this awakening must come from within. We talked about many other things that came to mind. They gave me a kind of chocolate bar sealed in plastic, which I opened and ate. Oh, he trusts them. <laughs> it had a taste like sabajon, a kind of mild liquor sold in Colombia, and my hunger disappeared completely. And then he said, we have something that we want to give you that is very important. My body began to warm all over. You're going to eat something very interesting and which you will like very much. They brought me something like a large white corn taco and told me to eat it. I broke it and put some in my mouth. In a moment I felt a tremendous sensation and warm feeling. I thought at that moment that they were drugging me. I don't understand why the words Cyril and Krishnamurk are together. But uh, Krishnamurk said, Do you know what they call that? The Jews were fed on that for 40 years in the desert. The manna of the scriptures, I said. No more, no less, was the reply. You were eating manna. 
and you will not get hungry for 24 hours. It gives you tremendous energy. It is prepared for us. Then ideas began to rush into my head so fast I could not coordinate them. I thought of Elias and of Moses, and then I returned to the present. I felt like I was going crazy. They laughed and simply observed. We were one of those who helped the Jews. Our great ship was always camouflaged. They could be made invisible by a simple change of vibrational energy right over the heads of the people, and they could not see them. I couldn't understand this then, and I can't today. I have a little more knowledge about it now, but I still do not completely understand. The public has asked many questions, and I have tried to answer, but I must confess my ignorance concerning a civilization so advanced as this, and they were trying to simplify everything as much as possible so that I could understand it better. After eating the substance, it made me sleepy, and they let me sleep about three hours. Then they came and awakened me. I was lying on a very comfortable bed, and where I had been lying, I left the imprint of my body. Pardon me, Enrique. You have awakened because we gave you a suggestion to awaken at this point. You are going to receive your last information, and it is time we left you in the place where we met you, a voice said. Kramakan had gone someplace and did not return. We circled the eastern plains, and they showed me a site that was illuminated like day. It was the site where we would next meet. Look well and observe the highway. Here we will meet again on the 18th of this month at 8 o'clock in the evening. They lowered the ship and passed slowly so that I could see the place well. I saw that the highway was long and ran through the mountains. I tried to remember all I could of the place, thinking I may have to come here by horse. They took me back and left me in the exact place where they had picked me up. They bid me goodbye with a form of embrace. With Cyril Weiss, I always talked in Spanish. The others bid me goodbye with strokes on my shoulder. We will see you, Cyril said, and I descended to the ground. They let me off about five o'clock in the morning. I slept a little and awakened and saw that my watch was running and indicated 11.15. I left the place running as fast as I could. I wanted to tell the whole world what had happened. The first person I met was a farmer leading a burro. And I said, pardon me, sir, what time is it? He replied, almost eight. Eight in the morning, sir. I calculated that I had slept about three hours. When I cut the bus at the road, I wanted to tell everybody. I wanted to tell the whole world what I had just lived. And I wanted to embrace all men. I was happy. When I returned to the house I had left the night before, I found some 60 people waiting for me. I met with the man who had made the telepathic contacts and began to give him the first information about the experience. I told him about the war and its timing and the great destruction and the great religious power around the earth and the years that remained of normal life. Nobody believed me, of course. They thought I was attacking religion and society for some reason of my own. I did not say much more then, nor ever in public, because I could see that it would cause confusion and possibly even harm. Could you just tell us the date of the war? I could only hope that someday all men would arrive at an understanding of the things I had just been shown. That is all that I can say about that first contact now. Comments from Wendell Stevens, the book's author. This was amazing. Enrique Carlos Rincon had received almost the same information from Pleiadians as was outlined to Edward Meyer in Switzerland by other Pleiadians only a little over a year later. The philosophy expressed and the criticism of our world deficiencies was almost identical, yet nothing had been released out of the Bogota group until some time after the Swiss contacts began. Even more astounding was the receptivity of the UFO community over these momentous events unfolding before their very eyes. An international UFO congress was gathered in Acapulco in 1978 that's the year I went there. The Yankees won the World Series that year. To assess the world UFO situation up to that time. 
It was well organized and well attended. One of the featured speakers at that Congress was Enrique Carlos Rincon, who very briefly described his contacts with Palladian ETs. His lecture was coolly received and politely put down by all the experts there, presumably because it had happened to him and not them. Jim Lawrenson of APRO, one of the stronger advocates of contactee phenomena at a time when most other clubs were throwing them out, sat next to Rincon at the speaker's table for three full days and never asked for more details on Rincon's contact experiences and never published anything on Rincon's report. Although I had, by that time, briefed him on what I found happening in Switzerland, he didn't believe me and he didn't believe Rincon. I never told him about any of the other Pleiadian cases I was encountering. He still refuses to accept any validity to any Pleiadian contact case. Open-minded. It was after that that I discovered the Akaya contacts going on in Peru and learned that Pleiadian ETs were discussing almost the same spiritual philosophies and scenario of events concerning our world, and that Witness was unaware of the other two, and they of him and his contacts. I knew nothing then of the Pleiadian contacts going on with Pedro Romaniuk in Argentina, or others with Deveris in Arkansas, here in the USA, and again, the philosophies and scenario of events was very similar. They all came under severe criticism for what they were revealing, and so they all began to hold back and release less and less to the world. That is the situation we are in today. Amazing indeed. The second meeting. The second meeting took place on the 18th of the same month as predicted, and I was gone 26 hours and the knowledge that I gained was tremendous and very disturbing and would completely fill a book by itself. There is much information that I cannot tell anyone, not even my friends in this experience. I had gone to the place at the appointed time. It was Eastern Colombia. The circumstances of this meeting were a little different. I arrived 15 minutes early by horse with a guide whom I paid 120 pesos. He left me at the designated place, but was disturbed leaving me in the jungle alone at night. They will pick me up here in a jeep, I said. Ah, you're going to the ranch of the Fulanos de Tal, he said, and I answered, precisely, that is where I'm going. <laughs> no, I'm going on a spaceship with some aliens. Really? De veras? But at these hours it is very dangerous here. There are tigers about. Do not worry about me, I said. Go in peace. I paid him, and he departed on his horse and left me there. And a tiger ate me. <laughs> the meeting did not take place at 8 o'clock in the evening, as indicated, but more like 3 o'clock in the morning. I walked 50 meters in this direction and 50 meters in that, but I did not leave the site. I kept looking in the clear and cloudless sky and waited until three o'clock when suddenly 13 spacecraft of Venus types arrived. Only one small descended and landed on three shoes. Chris Nomerk disembarking saying, brother, here. He told me to wait a minute and then he said, now come on, enter. And I did as invited. Inside, there were two small beings and they were not like those of the Pleiades. Meanwhile, back on the ground, a search party was dispatched to find the guy who was eaten by the tiger. They must know different races. He told me that those did not come from the Pleiades, but from Mercury, and they took me in that small craft. The small craft sat on three legs and had a diameter of four to five meters and was no more than two meters twenty high. It had two levels inside. We now entered through a cabin that had a metal stair, like in submarines, that went to the upper level, which was the control room. I did not see much of the ship as they transported us to a mother ship almost immediately. 
This card is really incredible. <laughs> I did not want to ask why such a long wait, though I was thinking that I could have been attacked by a snake or a tiger. If I had been bitten by one of the poisonous snakes, where could I go in the five minutes I would have to do something? The same with the tiger. Then I remembered that I had not been bitten by even a mosquito. An impossibility, unless the zone was protected in some way. Then I thought that the reason for the long delay may have been a test of my patience. They did not tell me this, but I had the feeling that they had tested me to see how long my patience would last. I was happy that I had passed their test. They opened the port and lowered the ladder, and we left the ship. They explained that the two strange craft, very different from the others, with a bow structure something like a great whale, were relieving the smog and air pollution of Bogota. Nice! I saw another with a similar bow structure, and they said a ship like that was the whale that swallowed Jonah. Hmm. These points of scripture kept coming up, and I thought, these extraterrestrials have certainly had contact with many of our prophets. This may lead us to a new concept of cosmic theology, as I told the Congress of Witchcraft, where mankind may become truly united with the superior entities, which we shall proudly call brothers, when we ascend to that understanding, when we make contact with these intelligences in mass. They did not let me off in the same place as they had picked me up this time. They left me much closer and near the highway. I asked them why they did not make contact with more people and with governments, and they said I would have an experience that would show me one reason why they were not doing this. It was getting daylight and must have been around 5.30 in the morning when they brought me in the small craft with the three crew members to let me off. In the farms of the plains, many people get up early to feed their animals and milk cows. The small craft made a circle over some people below. There were two men milking cows in a small shed behind a house. They saw the bright light and jumped up. The cow kicked one and also knocked over the pail of milk, and both men ran like they had seen the devil. We shot up rapidly behind some clouds where they couldn't see us. Then the farmer came out and the two men pointed up, moving their arms excitedly. A woman came out, drying her hands, and a child of about eight years old. And they all looked up but couldn't see anything. We were still in the cloud. Observe their reaction, said one. Yes, no need to explain. We have caused a panic. But these people are farmers, I said. Now we will try an experiment with slightly different people, the E.T. said. As we flew to the highway, where we saw a truckload of cattle approaching, we let it pass on. Behind it was a jeep, which we also let pass. Then came a pickup and an automobile, very close together, 100 to 120 meters apart. We let them pass. There comes a car alone. There is no other within kilometers, the E.T. said. We took a position above and held so that I could see. I could see through an electronic apparatus, which they had, that inside the auto were two men with suit coats and soft ties. One was driving while the other sat at his side talking. In the rear seat, another man had his collar turned up and was sleeping. The gentlemen seemed to be cultured, middle-class people from their dress and the appearance of their car. We descended in front and hovered alongside the road. They were so surprised to see us, so unexpectedly, that the two men in the front opened their doors to exit running. This doesn't prove anything except that when people are isolated that they panic. That's true, especially if you see something in the sky and you feel like you're the only one that sees it, you feel a little bit afraid. But if you go on national television and you speak and, and everyone becomes aware that aliens exist and now it's universally accepted, then all that scare is gone. And aliens ought to know that. This is baloney. The other, knowing nothing of what was taking place, fell off the seat when the driver hit the brakes. He stuck his head out the window and yelled something because I saw his mouth open. When he saw our craft parked above and to the side, 
he got out running and tore his coat trying to scramble through a barbed wire fence. That is the reaction of everyone, said my companion. Do you think that answers the question? Brothers, I said, though I know that I am with you, and this is the second time we have met, and knowing that you are living beings much advanced in evolution, there are many things which I still do not understand. I hope that in time I may be able to do so. I feel very honored and considerably humbled. They continued giving me information up to the last experience in Peru. New meeting. That took place on the 25th of July, 1974, when Guadalupe and Montserrat, professed spacemen, met me in Bogota. It was about 5 in the morning, and I spent 45 minutes in a spacecraft talking to them. We remained on the ground in the spacecraft and did not fly. This craft rested on three feet and was one of the Adamski type, but much smaller. It was not very big. This craft could not have been more than nine meters in diameter and no more than two meters eighty in height. Those spacemen that I saw then were no more than one and a half meters tall. All of them were alike, light colored, and looked much like those of the Pleiades, but smaller. I have seen others from Orion, Orton, Yamura, Yanika, Yaraka, and other places. I never heard of any of them, except Orion. Some of them also had no women with them. That's because they like earth chicks. In the second encounter on the 18th of November, I saw two women, and very beautiful they were for a few minutes. They were only beautiful for a few minutes. Oh, gosh, <laughs> this writer is so funny. Ah, uh, In the second encounter of the 18th of November, I saw two women for a few minutes. They were very beautiful. And I saw at that time on the mother craft a very strange being. I could not tell whether it was human or an automation, but they permitted me to see it. When I was walking with them in the ship, an automatic port opened and one of them passed by. It had a large head like a basketball and a transparent case. I thought I could see the brains and the veins and the organs and the eyes were large and moved like those of an iguana and could look on all sides. It walked like it was a robot with a thin gray uniform and boots and gauntlets of a dark blue and some colored buttons at the waist which was thin like a woman, not all women, <laughs> which with their broad shoulders gave them a triangular aspect. The door opened, there was a light, and it entered. We all turned to look as I continued talking to them. I did not ask about it. For the first time I saw a kind of symbol on its back, at the shoulder. Up to this time I had not seen any kind of mark or symbol. This was the first I had seen, and it was very strange. I had tried to draw the symbol since then, but I have forgotten one of the upper parts. It was a kind of an H, but it had something else above it, and I can't remember what it was. I had the feeling that they had let me see this creature to know that such did exist. I saw also a gigantic being of 2 meters 80, whom they told me was Jovian. He never spoke to me. He always kept his hands crossed. He watched me with a smile the whole time and never said a single word. He seemed to understand all. A strange thing happened with my ballpoint pen. I took out my pen to sketch the solar system for a question that had come from an anonymous letter delivered to the newspaper El Tiempo of Bogota. The writer had allegedly made contact with beings that looked like Hindus who operated a flying saucer. They told him that they came from a planet similar to Earth, that it was Earth's twin, and occupied the same orbit but on the opposite side of the sun, for which we never saw it. I wanted to ask if there was such a possibility, and I took out my pen and paper to sketch the orbit and see if I could make them understand. When I produced the pen, they all displayed great curiosity, especially the Jovian. Krishnamurk told me to let him see it. He took it apart and examined it and then gave it back. I asked him why the pen was of such interest. And Krishnamurk said, It is because we have one very similar. 
but you must see it. And they produced one fastened to a line to the table, so nobody steals it. <laughs> Write something. Here are papers. I took the pages, which were almost transparent, and paused over them. Write what you like. Make a sketch. Then this happened. They asked me if I could paint the house where I lived as a child, if I could remember it, and I said yes. But paint it. I can't even draw it, I said. Make anything. I said, I painted a butterfly when I was a little boy in school. And they said, do that then. So I began pressing the point, which was finer than ours. But the moment I pressed the button, the pen began to vibrate in my hand. And I heard a small sound and felt a slight vibration. But the most surprising thing came the moment I began drawing the butterfly. It came out in relief and in exact colors. I stared, but how is this possible? And they laughed and explained, whatever you have in your mind is captured and sketched exactly as you think it, in colors and in exact scale and size. This apparatus captures exactly the vibration, the color, the size of what you think and produces it accurately. Amazing. Amazing. We have to get some of those. The apparatus receives the vital image and translates it then into a sketch. I was stupefied. And then I understood their interest in my pen, which looked similar. <laughs> <laughs> After that, on the 24th and 25th of December, 1974, they took me to an energy vortices in the Andes. I was in Caracas, attending a conference, when they contacted and arranged a meeting. I boarded the spacecraft between two small villages near Caracas. One is called El Juquito, and the other, where many Germans live, is called Colonia Tovar. Colonia means neighborhood. I don't know what a Juquito is. From there they took me to the Vortis Five Minutes. It was in the uplands of Peru at 4,200 meters altitude, well, that's got to be 13,000 feet, between Marca Huasi and Machu Picchu. These beings have submarine bases in Lake Titicaca under the seas. I was taken to one of the bases in the Mariana Trench. That's the deepest ocean in the world. You have to be kidding me. I'm writing a science fiction story to be able to detail what is going on in the marine depths. Why science fiction? Nobody's going to believe it. They're going to think it's science fiction. By some manner, I'm going to give this information to the world. By science fiction? And I believe the time has come, and we are going to make together with others in Venezuela, kind of census of the public, of their opinions concerning flying saucers. Well, more than half now believe in them. So it's time to forget about science fiction, bring this forward as truth, personal testimony, and let's give it to the world directly. If they accept them, we want to know why. If they do not accept them, we also want to know why. This will serve to measure the information that can be released of that which we have. Little by little, we hope to give this information to the world as much as it can accept, to prepare them for the day when they shall also experience the UFOs hoping that they will not panic and that they will be a little bit prepared for what will happen. One may look around and see that we have availed ourselves of little of the vast amount of knowledge and experience we could have enjoyed. I like that pen. <laughs> Even this little was too much for many and for most of the UFO clubs. Boy, what a broad-minded group they are. Witness the treatment any contactee gets once he decides to reveal even a little of what is happening to him. He would be better off to have said nothing and to avail himself to these experiences in silence, which is exactly what most of them do after their first experience with the public. We may state that these experiences have gone on for years, and the descriptions and the dialogue up to now would fill volumes. The undersea base in the Pacific alone would take a whole volume to describe. There's one reason why we don't know this stuff, and that's leaders. Leaders who lead us astray. Leaders who lead us to failure, not victory. We need to become part of the galactic community. 
and exchange technology. I want that pen. <laughs> we have undertaken the task of translating Enrique Castillo Rincon's full report on his contacts from the original Spanish to English for your enlightenment. Our work title for that report is UFO Contact from Xi El Lo, the name which they called their home son, somewhere in what we call the Pleiades. Well, I have heard that most Pleiadians are not from the Pleiades. They're from a star system 80 light years past the Pleiades. But we are more familiar with the Pleiades, and that's the general direction. Maybe that's why they allow us to call them people from the Pleiades. El Tocoyo, Venezuela. During 1977 to 1979, before moving from Venezuela to Puerto Rico, Ramon Rosa Alvarado had a series of unique experiences as an observer in a local Venezuelan UFO group, which was being contacted by UFO knots who told the local contactee there that they came from the Pleiades. At that time, Alvarado and his wife were living near Ciudad El Docuyo, Distrito Moran, Venezuela, in a sugarcane growing district. Reports of strange disc shaped aerial objects were occurring almost every night. They would be seen approaching from below the crest of a small, sparsely vegetated mountain above the sugarcane field, and would fly about in the sky in all directions in a random fashion. Word had gotten out about the almost nightly visits, and people from all around began coming to the area to witness the phenomenon. You see? People are not afraid. They're coming to see it. They just want to know in advance that it's an alien ship, and then they come to see it. Maybe they're scared when they get there, but they're coming to see it. Does that tell you anything? One night around 8 p.m., Alvarado and his wife watched many different colored glowing objects of luminous disc form flying shelter over the cornfields. I don't know what that means, flying shelter over the cornfields. They were of blue, green, and amber radiance and were estimated to be 15 to 20 feet in diameter. Feet or meters? Ramon counted 25 such craft on this occasion. Some of them approached quite closely, and some hovered lowly over the cane tops, that sugar cane tops, and in other places only a couple of feet above the ground. The upper level of these operations was only about 400 to 500 feet above the ground surface. On this particular night, the witnesses saw a large number of shiny silver metallic balls, non-luminous but highly reflective, also flying around in the dark sky. What are they reflecting in the dark sky? Though these spheres were not luminous, they could nevertheless be easily seen in the light of the other disc-shaped UFOs. Oh. The balls reflected the many lights of the larger craft flying about. There may have been as many as several dozen such shiny balls, only a few inches to a few feet in diameter in several sizes. These silver balls kept moving rapidly and did not stop and hover like the luminous disc-shaped larger craft. Well, that's a weird sight. On another night, a few weeks later, Ramon and his wife joined a group of about 80 people who had come to witness the phenomenon. It was a Wednesday evening. The objects seemed to be most active in midweek. That's because aliens have the weekends off. And they had seen the lights below the top of the large hill. Suddenly they saw three of the blue and green 15 to 20 foot diameter glowing disc-shaped flying objects about four to 500 meters to the north of their position. The objects were situated one over the river to the north near the left road another to the right of dead center between the two roads, and a third over the cornfield across the road to the right. As one of the witnesses started down the road to the left with a jeep to get closer, the one to the far right began to approach up the right road. Alvarado and his wife were standing to the right, and the light came slowly toward them. <laughs> Suddenly a ball of white light, about one meter in diameter, burst into view in front of them and began to fly a tight vertical circle about 12 to 15 meters in diameter only a few feet away. Why does he keep mixing up the units, meters and feet? Mrs. Alvarado fainted from fright. Then a much larger round glow of light 
came on in the distance, across the river toward the hill. It must have been huge because all of the disc-shaped craft and the white ball of light raced toward it and went inside, and the whole thing rose and flew away as one object. Before they departed, however, the disc-shaped luminous craft on the right that was approaching up the road stopped and an array of horizontal light beams of several colors, including blue, green, violet, amber, and orange, came on on top of the object and radiated out horizontally. Then they began to rotate like helicopter blades in a counterclockwise direction, looking up or looking down. Anyway, uh, these light beams blinked out before this object went toward the larger light in the distance and went into it. There was a principal witness in that vicinity whom these alien visitors picked up and contacted directly. They addressed the contactee in his native Spanish, but they conversed among themselves in another language. When he asked what language it was, they called it Erdem. They said it was a proto-Sumerian tongue used long ago on Earth by their predecessors here, and that most other languages used on Earth today were derived from it. They said that their ancestors came from what we call the Pleiades. The space being said that they lived lifespans of a thousand to twelve hundred years of our time in a single physical embodiment. Oh, Methuselah died young. They said that they live simultaneously in the three dimensions we normally think of, plus a fourth dimension we know very little about at the present time. They said that the laws of the fourth dimension are entirely different, and that the speed of light in our dimension does not apply in the physics there. They said that they simply shift all matter up to the fourth dimensional state, and the laws of time and space change. They have offered scores of detailed descriptions on very scientific subjects, including other dimensions and other beings. Alvarado estimated the contact notes and the dialogue he has seen amounted to several hundred pages. I want to see this. I was wondering how they were able to travel 328 light years in the blink of an eye. These Pleiadians, like those visiting Switzerland, also describe two other planets in our solar system not familiar to us today. They called one of them Nemus and the other Cirrus. These are our spellings from the phonetics used. They said that these planets will be found in orbits between what we call Neptune and Pluto. How could that be? Pluto sometimes is inside the orbit of Neptune. The visitors to Switzerland said they were both beyond the orbit of Pluto. The visitors to Achaia said that one was inside and the other one outside the orbit of Pluto. We are unable to account for these disparities. However, the fact that all spoke of only two may be significant. They all mentioned undiscovered moons for the subsuns Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And they have now been proved to be correct in three out of four, and one still to be surveyed by close observation. They all said that there were many inhabited planets in the vast Pleiades systems. They were all aware of other human and non-human visitors to our planet at this time, and each was in active contact with some of those others. This is the last card for Chapter 7. A friend of one of the sugar farmers, Guillermo Torres, of Hacienda Las Cruz, near Ciudad El Tucoyo, successfully photographed one of the larger ships visiting this locality. It is seen as a large lens-shaped circular craft with a wide, low-profile, transparent, translucent dome on top. It occasionally radiates light from the rim, and some of this light is seen in the photograph. The skin surface of the craft seems to be matte gray in color and has a brushed metal finish. Two craft were an estimated 400 meters away when the picture was made. They all operated, used or shared bases, of limited accessibility in high mountain peaks and in equally inaccessible underwater locations. This is the end of chapter 7. Light came out. These giant objects, such tremendous spectacle, gave me new cause for alarm. And then it fell silent. I could only hear a very low sound dying down. They hung there in the sky. 
about a hundred meters between the two, as best I could calculate. These objects were shaped like huge soup plates, joined at the rims. They were about 45 meters in diameter, and about 12 meters from top to bottom. I could see the cupola on top very clearly. The light slowly dimmed down, leaving only a small, bright light source illuminated. It lighted only the area directly under the craft. Then one of the ships began to approach. The other remained quietly in place. It gave me a new fright to see this tremendous monster so close. And then it stopped, suspended above the small stream there, and two lateral beams of light came on. These new beams shined down, and I saw two beings descending in them as in an elevator. <laughs> wow, a beam of light elevator. In their descent, they disappeared behind the trees from my position, and I couldn't see them land. Then I heard their steps as they approached. <laughs> At this moment, all of the lights on the spacecraft went out, and they remained completely silent. After seeing the tremendous luminosity bright as day, I couldn't see anything when the light went out. And then I heard the steps of the beings, and then I saw them at 10 meters away. They approached, separated, one from the other. They wore helmets and suits that seemed very fitted, and I could see them clearly as they neared me. Then I heard the first telepathic communication. Brother, we are here, do not fear. Men, and it smelled like lemon. It only lasted a minute, and was then drawn out through some rectangular openings in the wall and disappeared. Then I noticed that there was no shadow from my body anywhere, and I thought, where's the light coming from? I could not see any lamps. Then they gave me my clothes, which I put on, leaving the ruana and sombrero aside. They opened a door and said, now you may proceed. They explained that the process was simply to disinfect everything from whatever microbes we may have brought from the Earth's surface. I went into the first compartment that they opened, and there were four persons seated there, waiting for me. I came to the first one, and he said, Enrique, how are you? And gave me his hand. He gave me his hand like we shake hands and said, How are you, brother? I am going to shake your hand, said another. This, indicating the first, is the commander. He said his name was what sounded like Cramish. I gave him my hand, and he gave me some thumps on it. The rest greeted me this way also. The only one who did not give me his hand was the first who had said, Brother Enrique. He now turned to me and said, I am Cyril. I said, How are you, Cyril? And he said, Cyril. Cyril Weiss. Remember in 1969 in Caracas, Venezuela, at the entrance to the theater, when we met? And I said, Cyril Weiss. Oh, Cyril Weiss, but you are a little changed. And what are you doing here? And he said, I am one of the crew of this ship. I was terribly surprised. He said, we have been in contact with you for eight years. I understood now why they had given me their hands like Terrans. Then he presented me to the others. There was one by the Luco spacesuit, well, because of the dark, and I could not see up to now exactly what color they were. Then they stopped me and said they could sense a little worry. He was terrified. <laughs> At that moment, the spacecraft came forward and flashed a ray of light. I felt tremendous thrills and some twitching in all the skin of my head, like needles pricking me. I stood erect and began to ascend. When I saw that I was leaving the trees below, I thought, what if I should fall? I continued to ascend like in an elevator. I was surrounded by a yellowish light. It gave me the impression of being solid. I tried to touch it with my hands, and it felt solid like crystal. It must have been only energy because I did not see crystal. I didn't see anything. But when I touched the light, it felt solid. I felt a thump and then a port began to open, and there it was, fully open, and I was inside, and it closed. A moment later, the other two entered, removed their helmet, and smiled. They had taken their helmets off so I could see their faces. They asked me for the sphere, which I gave them, and then they said, wait here, take off your clothes, and I took everything off. They opened an automatic port, and we entered. 
Then they opened a side port like a window and looked at me smiling. I don't like to get naked in front of aliens. I heard a voice say, don't be afraid, we're going to enter a little smoke. But this is necessary. Do not be afraid. In spite of their assurances, I associated this immediately with the Nazis gassing the Jews. Wow. <laughs> I did not see where the smoke came from, but it came in. This is Chapter 7, Part 2. I went into the clump of trees, remembering mentally that over there was where I had seen a clearing. I reached it at about 20.10, 10 minutes after 8 p.m. I was 10 minutes late and worried about this. I still had the sphere in my hands, and I looked around me, but didn't see anything unusual. I looked up and saw only branches and leaves. Then I heard something like a distant boat motor, which was lost in the distance. I waited in the woods as the minutes passed, terribly slowly. I looked at my watch, and it was now 2015. I thought, dear God, what is going to happen? Protect me in any case. <laughs> I began to feel fear. It gave me a sincere fright. There I was, representing all the people who were praying for me and thinking of backing out. I decided I would not give up. At 2025, I began to hear a tremendous noise. I was in the woods and could not tell where it was coming from. Suddenly, the whole area was illuminated brilliantly. Two huge craft approached and passed directly over me. They came streaming water as if they had come from the bottom of the lake. Water cascaded from the sides like from a submarine when it surfaces. I waited breathless as I watched. They flew over me and the whole area warmed up from the heat. They must have put out a tremendous amount of energy. These craft were flattened disc forms and underneath I could see something that rotated. And below that I saw three large white round parts that turned slowly and a color here. Ooh. <laughs> we are your friends. They tried to coordinate my ideas and thought. Yes, why not? I am not afraid. He peed his pants, that's all. Then I heard the voice say, I am your friend, Enrique. Do not be afraid. I shook my head. <laughs> I'm not afraid. <laughs> I could see that they were tall, more than a meter seventy in stature. That's not very tall. <laughs> When they came up to within two meters of me, he said, I am your friend, do not be afraid. I said, yes. And the other said, if you are not ready, we can suspend this until another day. If you are not afraid, we can continue this contact and we may ascend aboard. <laughs> oh boy. I said I was ready and I t -t 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 took a step forward. <laughs> so that they could see that I had lost my f f f f fear <laughs> They noticed that I was a little wary, and one of them took me by the hand and the other by my shoulder and said, Walk with us up to the light. We went a few meters forward, and one of them said, Straight ahead, you feel a little worry in your head and in your body, but nothing is going to happen to you. The other said, Brother Enrique, we guarantee it. We do not want to cause you any harm. And then they ate him. <laughs> Moreover, if you are still afraid, you may return, and we will prepare this for another day. I could not see their faces for the helmets. I asked if the helmets had visors, and a form of visor raised a little in front of one, showing the nose and mouth, but partly covering the mouth, which had a rectangular shape. I could not see the mama 